Good evening, and I'd like to welcome you all for this program uh, on Catholic faith, evangelization, society and culture. Uh, my name is Piotr Bednarski. I'm host of this program. Uh, today we've got a special guest, Dr. Richard de Clou. Richard is a seasoned theologian and graduate of uh, uh, Belmont Abbey College, but he's, uh, he made his degree in, in uh, theology and PhD at Catholic University uh, of America. Uh, speci he specializes in systematic theology with particular interest in uh, Joseph Ratzinger theological thought and Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. Uh, he's, uh, he, he wrote his doctoral degree, doctoral thesis on Joseph Ratzinger theology and he's, um, he's quite uh, active in terms of the publication of theological articles and he is a member of and, and, and one of the leading theologians in Word on Fire Institute established by, um, the, by very recognized uh, evangelizer Bishop Robert Barron. So Richard, welcome you today in our program and we are very happy that you, this, uh, that you agreed to, 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 to be with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and it's an honor to be invited. Thank you. And uh, I need to mention that this program is organized by the uh, by the um, EWTN Pol Polska Christian Center for Culture of Mary, our Queen, Lay Catholics Association, Przybądźcie Wierni. We are running this program together with my colleague and friend Zbigniew Przybyłowski and we are supported by Antoni Filipkiewicz of EWTN Poland. Uh, following our good tradition, we would like to pray our Father in Latin and pray for the peace in the world, for the, for the peace especially in, uh, in the Middle East, in, in the Holy Land, in Ukraine and other parts of the world when the conflicts are uh, um, threatening lives and, and uh, health of many people. Uh, let's pray in Latin. Pater Noster, quies in celis, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, in cello et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum, da nobis, odie, et dimitia nostri, sicut et nos dimitim, et non nos inducas in tentazione, sed libera nos amala. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Good evening, Richard. Um, let us start the conversation with a brief introduction of yourselves. Could you tell us in brief words, who are you and what do you do? Yes, uh, my name is Richard D. Clue. I am the professor of theology at the Word on Fire Institute. And um, I live and work in the United States and do a lot of teaching and writing on various theological topics. Okay, and could you tell us a little bit about your uh, journey to faith? Were you a, a cradle Catholic or did you convert? What, what is the story of your spiritual development, if you will? I'm a cradle Catholic. I was born into a very devout Catholic family um, on both sides. So my grandparents on my mom and my father's side were also very devoutly Catholic. My parents obviously were very devoutly Catholic. Um, so I, I don't remember a time in my life when the faith wasn't important. It, it's always been at the center of who I am and of my life. So, um, yeah, that. Are you, I noticed that your name sounds a little bit um, French, not very American. Are you of a French background or? Yes, or is it... my father's family is French. And okay. my mother's side is Italian Irish. Okay, so all, all, all Catholics. <laughs> yep. And can you tell us a little bit about um, sort of your path in terms of your uh, career? Did you decide uh, early on that theology is something that you wanted to follow, or did your journey go in other directions first? Yeah, so I was always interested in philosophy and theology since I was young. I started reading Peter Kreeft when I was in middle school. 
but I had never really considered it as a career. I originally went to um, university as a pre-veterinary medicine and biology major with a minor in chemistry. And I tutored math and chemistry at the university. And I eventually decided that I wanted to drop the veterinary medicine part and go into biomedical research and development. But I ended up transferring to Belmont Abbey College and I began to consider theology as a possible alternative major. So I spent a lot of time praying and thinking about it, a lot of hours in the Adoration Chapel, and I tried to meditate on envisioning myself doing the biology research and doing theology. And I realized that I could see myself doing both and enjoying both, but the thought of not doing theology was more difficult for me. I felt like I would miss theology more than I would biology. And mainly because I've always been more interested in why questions and questions of meaning rather than what questions or questions about fact. Um, so the, the level of meaning and purpose. So I was just switched my major halfway through college and then the rest is history. Yeah, we've um, seen uh, a number of sort of testimonies of people who went into science and found um, mystery, found God in, in, in the unsolved. Uh, mysteries of science um, and so your journey wasn't one of those your journey was you always wanted to know the why question you always wanted to to be close to God am I right yes and even when I was a biology student I always saw the biology I was studying as confirmation of my faith um, one reason I was drawn to biology specifically was because of how amazing God's design is in even the way a, a cell works is absolutely mind boggling. And so the more I studied science, the more it actually confirmed to me um, the wisdom of the creator. Okay. And then you found no um, sort of evidence that there is no God in science. So some, some people go into the universities, um, find that um, they find it difficult to believe in God anymore. Um, and I'm not sure if this is the knowledge that they get or if this is exposure to hostile environment, environment hostile to their religion. Um, but um, I, I, guess, I guess that most people do not find uh, it difficult to reconcile science and, and, and religion. I saw that um, you had a lecture about how the Catholic Church and Catholic religion created science. Can you just say a couple of words about that? Yeah, I've given a couple of seminar talks on that question and published an article related to it in the Church Life Journal that's put out by the University of Notre Dame. Um, yeah, so basically I was just invited to give a presentation at the We're, Not, the We're on Fire Wonder Conference, and which was on faith and science. And hi, um, we had a number of speakers from Ivy League universities that are scientists and historians of science who only confirmed what I had already held as well. And um, yeah, the more you research the, the actual history of the, the church's relation to science, it's, it's pretty clear that the church was a key element in actually the development and support of the natural sciences. Okay. And when you went to uh, study theology, you were looking for sort of answers for yourself or were you looking for opportunities to evangelize and bring others to, uh, to God? Which one was that? I mean, both, but there was a certain evangelical point to it because I wanted to learn more so that I could share more. I, from a young age, I'd always been concerned about the salvation of souls, especially looking around at my peers and society in general. And I would be very sad at, at people's ignorance of the, the beauty of our faith. I always saw our faith as something beautiful and a great treasure, 
and felt a sadness that so few people seem to possess that treasure. And so I, I really did want to study theology so that I could teach other people about it so they too could share in this wonderful gift we've been given of divine revelation. And is there is there a way, do you see a way of getting people interested in, in asking these questions if they are not sort of inclined this way themselves from, from nature? Or do you have to be born with that inquisitive mind, you know, and that need to seek God in order to find him? I think you can tease it out of people. You know, very often in our world today, people just sort of live moment to moment. But if you can engage them in, in conversations and just ask them, well, you know, probing questions like, well, what do you think the whole meaning and purpose of life is? Mm -hmm. You know, is it really all about just getting money and retiring early or is there a higher meaning to it? Do you believe that values are real and not just some evolutionary, you know, leftover? And um, I think there's ways of, of getting, of asking people questions that make them think. And once they're, those questions are presented to them, in some ways they might not be able to, to help themselves from thinking about them. Now, they might become uncomfortable and try to ignore it, but um, I do think people can begin to have that wonder once it's presented to them. You know, the mind naturally does want to know. And if you can get them out of that state of merely satisfying the appetites and get them to actually think about deeper questions, they'll begin to hunger for it. Yeah. And do you think that people would be inclined to seek God in good times, in times of success? Or does the society, does the economy have to reach a certain um, point of disruption uh, in order for people to actually turn to things bigger than um, retirement? I think it depends on the person, but at the same time, there does seem to be a correlation between hitting rock bottom or having difficult times and then recognizing that you're not in control of everything. Mm -hmm. that you begin to see that maybe there is, you do need assistance or help and that you aren't the master of everything. And that level of humility and desperation can help people begin to ask those more important questions. So that's on the individual level. How about the level of societies and nations like, you know, America or Poland? Do we have to really crash in order to um, start wondering about what we've done wrong? I don't think we have to as in a logical necessity, um, but sometimes existentially that's what it takes. And I think, sadly, you'll see that work when countries go through very desperate times, sometimes the faith gets stronger, then they become prosperous, and then they forget what the lessons they learned. And we see that in the Old Testament all the time too, right? So um, there, seem, there does seem to be some, when we get comfortable, we can get intellectually and spiritually lazy. And I think that's the reason that correlation exists. Okay. All right. So um, coming back to your, to your studies, I wanted to ask you, when did you get interested in uh, um, the work and thinking of uh, Cardinal Ratzinger? Um, was it something early on or did you discover him during your studies? How did that happen? I knew of him vaguely when he was the prefect for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith in the late 90s, early 2000s. And I liked what I knew of him, but I didn't know his work that well until a few years later. So I probably started studying him somewhere around 2004, 2005. And once I started getting a little bit, I 
just wanted to read more and more of him. And so um, that's really when my interest in him peaked was during that, you know, 2004, 2005 is when I became a, a very huge fan of his theology. And then it just grew from there over the years. So what were the most sort of attractive aspects about um, his theology to you? Well, a few different ones. One was his the unity of the head and the heart, mm. of the intellect and the will, or the, the truth and love, and how those really came together in his thought, and how he helped me. The, there was a certain wisdom to the way he, he did theology and the way he conveyed it, where he wasn't always proving something to me, but he was showing it to me. He was like removing a veil and allowing me to see the beauty of the truth he was conveying to where at the same time that your head's recognizing the truth, your heart is rejoicing in it. And that the his view of the whole, it seemed to me like each aspect of his thought related to every other aspect. It was part of one truth. And so he was the one who really helped me understand the unity of the Catholic faith as one mystery with different aspects that are all interrelated and mutually illuminate one another. So that was, I think, the, the main thing for me. Okay. Okay. I, one of the things that kind of struck me is when you... Um, like yourself, when uh, John Paul was the Pope, uh, we hardly uh, thought about uh, Cardinal Ratzinger. We were always seeing John Paul. And then when Cardinal Ratzinger visited Poland, the striking thing about him was the clarity of his thought. There was no poetry, if you will, no uh, performance. Uh, Holy uh, St. John Paul II liked to sort of uh, uh, entertained a little bit when he was when he was preaching, but uh, Cardinal Ratzinger was uh, was was very direct and very clear in his message. And um, was that always a feature of his personality, or did, it, did this develop? And I just wanted to ask this question because I wanted to ask you if there is a continuity of thought uh, in what Cardinal Ratzinger or Bishop Ratzinger was thinking back in the days of uh, Vaticanum Secundum, and then uh, later on uh, during his uh, service as a, as in, in the, in the uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, and then later on as Pope. Is there a development, is there evolution, or is there a continuity? I hold to the view that by and large, his thought is more in continuity over time. Mm -hmm. I think the idea that he had a radical shift in like 1968 is not accurate. I think that's been perpetuated by, I believe it was Hans Kuhn who sort of made that a popular theory. But if you, you listen to the witness of his own students from that time, they'll tell you, no, this is, his thought later on is very much in line with what he was teaching us before that time. Um, He's always been somewhat of a shy personality, mm -hmm. um, and yet also very affective. Very, he has an emotional side, um, but in a in a humble, sort of shy way. Um, but overall, his thought itself, I think, has been relatively consistent. And there is also a um, sort of a, a um, theory or a thought that his approach to um, the reforms of the Vatican uh, Council, Second Vatican Council, changed over time. Is that also a misconception or is there a, a, a grain of truth to that? It's mostly a misconception with some grain of truth. What when it comes to the actual documents of the council, I think he's been pretty consistent regarding what they actually say. What he lamented was the poor implementation of the council 
And he acknowledged that while as theological experts at the council, they were more focused on getting the theology right, they didn't pay enough attention to how it would be received or perceived in the wider world, like in this in the in the less theologically trained world of mass media, for instance, that they didn't take into consideration how what they were doing would actually be understood or interpreted. And so he did lament the fact that they weren't more self-aware of the difference between what we're actually saying, but, and how it will be heard. Okay. Let me ask you uh, now more in, in depth question, what do you believe that be to be key pillars of Joseph Ratzinger? Because if you read one of his first books, Introduction to Christianity, or his interest in Bonaventura, uh, event, uh, he, he, at a certain point, he was considered in 50s and beginning of 60s, he was considered rather progressive theologian. And then after this uh, kind of emerging conflict between uh, those who followed the path of uh, Karl Rahner or uh, Hans Küng uh, with uh, uh, the clash between Communio and Concilium, do, do you see? Do you see? Where do you see the fundamentals of his uh, theological thoughts? Because he wrote quite a number of books and and uh, articles, and uh, his uh, his book on on Jesus Christ, the uh, issued during published during his papacy, is 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 is, is, is separate. Uh, I would say endeavor. So, how would you characterize his major? Uh, uh, major themes or directions in theology. And, and the second question is how fa similar and how different is Pope Benedict's writings on the role and mission of theologian? He wrote a book on that. And the recent document of the Pope uh, Ad Theologium Pro uh, Pro uh, Promovendum. Do, do you see difference in uh, stress, in focus between Ratzinger approach to to theology and the role of theologians and and the, the recent pope's document okay so i'll i'll try to answer those in mm -hmm. roughly the same order that you asked them but the the issue of him being perceived as more liberal and then later on being perceived as more conservative or traditional i think has to do with a, a number of different factors, but one of them is that his same position before the council would have been considered more liberal and that same position after would have been considered more conservative. So what do I mean by that? Before the council, if you are a theologian who's not really interested in Thomistic speculative theology, and is more interested in going back to the sources of scripture and the church fathers and has more of a leaning towards the platonic rather than the Aristotelian metaphysics or philosophy and a greater appreciation of Bonaventure rather than Thomas, that could be perceived as liberal because the status quo at the time was neo-Thomistic scholasticism. You mean Garigou Lagrange and this kind of persons. Yeah. Right. So he would have been perceived as being in some sense more progressive insofar as he was not a big fan of neo-scholasticism. Mm -hmm. But that his approach to theology really didn't change after the council, because then you had the split with, you know, the communio and concilium routes, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. those who were wanting to not use modern contemporary philosophy and popular opinion as the basis of theology, but wanted to go back to the scriptures and the fathers would be considered more traditional or conservative by comparison. So do you, so maybe that helps explain how he's staying the same, but the view of that position shifted. Because after the council, you have a lot more progressive theology being done. And so a return to the sources was actually considered conservative. Whereas before the council, that would have been considered more progressive or liberal because it wasn't 
the standard way of doing theology in that time. Does that mean that the whole um, mainstream of the church shifted so dramatically that um, that in Cardinal Ratzinger being on the uh, sort of it, I know that these are not accurate comparisons, but uh, let's let's use the left right, yeah. So it, he's on the left, and then the church shifted so much that he find found himself on the right uh, all of a sudden. Is that the, the, yeah, the truth? In, in a way, with one caveat, I don't. So he may have been perceived as a liberal or towards the left before the council in comparison to the neo Thomist tradition. But I still don't think you could accurately portray his theology as to the left, because I don't think being rooted in scripture and the church fathers is a liberal progressive idea. So Ratzinger read like modern philosophy but he always was an advocate of realist metaphysics. He just preferred the more Neoplatonic, Augustinian, Bonaventurian approach to the more Aristotelian approach of the, the Neotomus. So he was never really a progressive, if by progressive we mean a quasi-neo-modernist, because he was never he never really adopted modern philosophy in those outlooks. He was always rooted in the tradition. It was just a different strand of the tradition. So mm -hmm. I hope maybe that helps clarify. Yeah, if, if we can return to this comparison, uh, the theologian according to Ratzinger, theology according to Pope Francis, do, do you see a certain shift in terms of the focus, in terms of the content, and the manner of uh, how theology should be should be should be done i think there's some points of similarity and some points of difference so mm -hmm. i'll start with the points of similarity mm -hmm. both did think that the one of theology's roles is to address the issues of the day so even though ratzinger was very much focused on retrieving the tradition of scripture and tradition and the fathers it was precisely to help address the problems of the current era. Mm -hmm. Similarly, Pope Francis is very much focused on addressing things that are going on in society today. Um, so that's a point of similarity. Um, I think, I don't know, I'll just be honest, I don't know Pope Francis's theology apart from his papacy, as well as I know Ratzinger's work prior to his papacy. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it seems to me that Pope Benedict had a much more directly, a more direct citation of the tradition and of scripture in his work, meaning it was he he, he, maybe you could put it this way. Pope Francis seems to start from a theology from below and Ratzinger starts from a theology of, from above. So they're both trying to address the issues of the day, but Ratzinger always starts with the sort of theology from above. Like, well, what is the truth that we have learned from scripture and tradition? Let's learn that really well. And then, okay, how do we apply that here and now? Um, so the, the background, the emphasis is on the scripture and tradition and, and then applying that to the specific situation, um, where Pope Fran, and, and therefore in some sense, it's also going to be a little bit more general. Now it's, it's applying it to the specific circumstances, but it's not a casuistry in the sense of, it's not thinking about individual tough cases it's whereas francis seems to in some and i could be wrong on this but he seems to start from the most concrete circumstances and in individual cases and then thinks how can we approach that from scripture and tradition but the, the starting point of of asking and answering the question seems to be somewhat different if that makes sense 
don't you think that there is also a different level of absorption of the concepts, language, and theories coming from the secular world? Because uh, when you read uh, Cardinal Ratzinger or Father Ratzinger books, of course, there is inspiration from uh, some contemporary philosophical trends, but he seems to be very much attached to the concepts uh, rooted deeply in, in, in a long-lasting tradition. Mm -hmm. While when you read, uh, for example, some of the encyclicals of uh, Pope Francis, you see a, a big difference in terms of the impact of the secular concepts. For example, nowadays this very popular ecological or climate change, uh, I would say, ideology or concepts are coming directly into papal documents. While in Ratzinger, you see certain distance, especially after uh, 68 and or seven, after 70s, when, when this aggiornamento opening of the church and absorption without sometimes prudence and, I would say, realistic assess assessment, what we are absorbing, uh, opened the door to, in church to very, I would say, different trends and sometimes contradictory to our faith. How you see this absorption of the in, of the uh, uh, external culture, uh, concepts, philosophies into Catholic theology in both cases? I, I can't speak as much about the absorption in Pope Francis because I don't know his work as well. Not, mm -hmm. I don't know it nearly as well as I do Pope Benedict's. I think both of them do address contemporary issues, mm -hmm. um, but you are correct that Pope Benedict addresses them very much. He he brings the gospel in, in the tradition to that specific situation, to that specific question, and but his terminology is going to be rooted in that tradition. Um, I don't really know as much about Pope Francis and his approach, um, the way that he thinks through things. I don't, I don't really have a grasp on his thought process the way that I do Ratzinger or Benedict's. So it's hard for me to, to make too much of a comparison. Um, I do think that Pope Benedict was very, could very directly state the problems of modern thought so he wouldn't, he would take their questions, but then also show them sometimes why they were asking the wrong question or why they were thinking the wrong way. And he, he did a, a great job of trying to reveal the mistakes of modern thought and what they were thinking. Um, so that might be one way to answer the question. Mm, that That's a very, very good uh, insight because when you uh, hear sometimes the pronouncement of some very high-level prelates of the Catholic Church and the, the, the claims that we we are 200 years behind the culture. Uh, this is what Cardinal, uh, the late Cardinal Martini claimed, that Catholic mm -hmm. Church is just because it's it's backward. It's, it's 200 years uh, backward. So, uh, and you hear Cardinal Hollery saying that Catholic Church needs to absorb the modern sexuology, psychology, you know, in, in recognizing certain new trends in, in society and culture. You, you raise the question, and this is just like a Catholic question, to what extent this opening, this adjournment or this dialogue with external world could, could go uh, without losing our identity and our language, our concepts, because language and concepts have a lot of consequences. If you look at the uh, th theology of South America, especially this radical Marxist theology, the, the, the concept changed completely perception of, of certain things. So if you could elaborate a little bit, to what extent theology can bring to the table concepts which are from different traditions, completely secular traditions, to what extent this dialogue makes sense? If you talk, to, if you listen to, for example, contemporary theology like Fagioli or some others, they, they seem to very easily absorb uh, the external concepts uh, into theology. I think 
a proper aggiornamento cannot take place without an authentic resourcement. Mm -hmm. That you you always must update the church by learning from the tradition and applying it to the circumstances of the day. I think dialogue is important because it's part of the missionary activity of the church. We see that with St. Paul, mm -hmm. right, in the book of Acts. So you do have to engage with the culture where it is at. But the purpose of the church's engagement with the modern world is to transform the modern world according to the gospel, not adapt the gospel to the popular opinions of the modern world. And this is one way, when I was a, a first year um, graduate student that really came to home for me was, I call this the difference between theology and anti-theology. Theology is seeking to be an advocate for the church to the world and help to conform the world to the truth of the faith, whereas anti-theology is an attempt to be an advocate for the general cultural norms to the church to conform the church to the world. And so I see it as the exact opposite of what theology is supposed to be. We are supposed to lead the culture and purify the culture, not be led by the culture and corrupted by the culture. Mm -hmm. Do you think in that context that those who are part of the concilium, like Karl Rahner and Hans Küng and others, with the concept like Karl Rahner concept of anonymous Christian or fundamental choice, is a sort of adaptation to the world using quite sophisticated co concepts like fundamental choice and the, the rest is, is not important, the particular choices, moral choices are not important because you've done this fundamental choice and you are with Christ sort of forever. Do, do you think that this kind of uh, engineering of in theology can can really be helpful in, in building the, the the faith of of people because it gives some uh, I would say uh, possibility of of agreeing with the world, but whether it's really faithful to gospel is a big question mark. And I, when I was at Catholic University of America just a few years ago, Charles Curran was was. Uh, was dismissed from theology department. He sued the university. He lost his case. Even if university offered him the religious study department, but he was he wanted to get back to, to theology. And for for a few years, he he was appreciated by students, and he was dissident theologian in, in Catholic university. There were protests when he was, in a, I would say, criticized by the, the by the the Congregation for Doctrine and Faith, and finally he, 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 he left the university. How, 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 to, how to find this, this balance in theology? Because you, you go on thin line, in fact. Yes, so there's a, the lot, there's a lot I could say about this. Um, I'll start with the fundamental option. The, the problem with the fundamental option theory is that it doesn't take into account that one mortal sin can completely change the direction of your your salvation and of your relationship to God. And so this idea that individual sins don't matter is fundamentally flawed. Every sin that we choose to do negatively impacts our ontology, our metaphysical status, which therefore damages our relationship to God and therefore imperils our salvation. You can't say, well, generally I'm a good person who loves God, and, you know, well, I know he doesn't like this act, but it's just one act, who cares? Like, you have to you have to take sin seriously. Um, so there, there's already a problem with that, because we know, you know, that every sin negatively impacts us. Um, Karl Rahner... I don't want to get in too much of a rabbit hole, but he's a very complex figure. Um, I don't think he's actually as progressive as some people think, at least in his early to mid career. He may have gotten more liberal towards the end. Um, so I think he's often misunderstood, but a lot of his epigons, a lot of his followers 
have taken him to very bad places. So if you look at anonymous Christianity and that theory itself, in its very tightly constructed argument, it's not as bad as it sounds. But it has been, it can be and has been taken to very problematic ways. Um, Ratzinger's critique of anonymous Christian, even though he mentions anonymous Christ, a Christian in his critique, I think it actually applies more to Rahner's understanding of revelation and this notion of, you know, man just accepting who he is or as the gospel being sort of the recognition of that which man already has some, you know, pre-apprehension of with regards to his being, whereas Ratzinger rightly notes that, no, the gospel is completely that which is not necessarily an unexpected. It's the inbreaking of, of the divine in a completely undeserved, unexpected, unnecessary way, so that it's, it truly is not something you can just deduce from the, the natural world itself. That brings up a whole bunch of other questions we don't have time to get into. Um, but ironically, Rahner was actually much more scholastic than Ratzinger. But I think where Rahner ended up having a lot of problems was he was much more open to trying to adapt modern philosophy into the faith and in in the attempt to try to salvage whatever good might be found in it, sort of lost his way. And um, so I know this is not really the way you probably expect me to answer the question, but I I have a mixed view on, on Rahner because I knew some of his students that are actually very good and very conservative and orthodox. Um, and I also give him, him some credit because remember, he was a student of Heidegger and he decided to write his philosophy dissertation defending St. Thomas's metaphysics of knowledge. And as a result, his dissertation was rejected. So there's some, I just, I, I like to give him some credit because he, and he also worked against Kuhn. He was the editor of the volume rejecting Kuhn's rejection of papal infallibility. So he rejected on Kuhn's position on that. But you are correct, especially in the later years, Rahner had some very problematic and sometimes odd under um, ideas that, you know, the whole notion of, oh, well, let's reformulate creeds into these new formulations that really don't make a whole lot of sense. And as you were saying, it it it, it seems like he missed the importance of the, the tradition of language and how it's used in what we speak about, right? I believe you, you sort of hinted at that earlier and how important terms are and maintaining the formulations the way we always have. In his attempt to try to make the faith more understandable to the modern world, I think he, whether intentionally or not, actually obscured the faith by uh, bending too much to modern philosophy and not adequately pointing out its its errors. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting what you're saying, because it, when you listen to Bishop Barron, for example, or worked on on fire uh, speakers. They try to start from the Catholic position, from the uh, or uh, Thomistic tradition, or scholastic mm -hmm. tradition, or uh, let's say Bonaventurian tradition. Sometimes reconciling both yeah. uh, as a starting point for dialogue with the world, not adopting the concepts from the world to to start internal dialogue in in, in Catholicism. Would you agree right. with this kind of observation? Yes, I would. And I would point out that one of the reasons that, especially in America, from what I've heard, Rahner, well, Rahner and Rahnerianism dominated the universities in America for decades. 
And part of the problem was, part of the problem was some of Rahner's own works, but another part of the problem was the way that his own works were also further corrupted by his, his supposed advocates. Like he, his own thought was even distorted by his own disciples and was pushed in an even more liberal and progressive direction than he originally had. Mm-hmm. So um, in, in many, I happened to have a couple of professors that were more, that knew Rahner more and were a little bit more faithful to his own thought than a lot of the other professors that were teaching at the time. Um, but yes, the, the, the big difference there is you drawing from scripture and the tradition and the, the perennial philosophy to address the issues of the day rather than adopting modern philosophy as if it's just as compatible with the faith, because it's not, mm-hmm. you, you, you can't replace Neoplatonic Aristotelian metaphysics and epistemology with Kant and Hegel and Heidegger. You, you can't mm-hmm. do that because they're the, and, and Marxism, you can't do that because those philosophies contain fundamental errors in philosophy that are incompatible with divine revelation. And so, yes, I would agree that our approach tends to be much more rooted in the Thomistic and patristic tradition, um, especially when it comes to philosophy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And especially when you started to allude to unf- un- philosophical anthropology, the concept of a man, because this is one of the root, root uh, causes of a certain, I would say, division in the church that's... Uh, there are theologians who adopt completely different uh, anthropology. For example, if you believe that the soul is 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 a prisoner of 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 body, and uh, and the, the and the consequence of that is that you could choose different body because the to to free your soul, to free your to exes- exercise your freedom, then you you might end up with with transgender ideology. Uh, do, do you see this kind of? Uh, co- connection that uh, the, the the way you ad- adopt the, way, the, uh, the the type of anthropology adopt in understanding of a man translates into the uh, further ethical and and even in the theological consequences. Absolutely. I think many of the ills of modern society are rooted in its loss of metaphysics of a, a realist metaphysics that sees ontology as something that we can't control by sheer fiat or will. It's our society seems to want, it's the Nietzschean will to power as if we can, or even Sartre, right? It's this notion of, well, there it really is no nature. It's just, you know, I have to choose for myself what it means to be human. And then even Sartre recognized that that actually leads to hell because that means there really is no meaning. It's all arbitrary. Um, but yes, this law, this loss of metaphysics and the reality of things, the reality of natures and what they, what their, what their essence is and what their telos is, what their, their goal is, um, what is perfective of that nature versus what destroys it has been completely rejected by modern culture to the point where, at one and the same time, we claim to be very scientific, and on the other hand, completely deny scientific fact about biology whenever it suits us. Mm-hmm. You know, as if, well, no, we're very scientific and we're beholden to science, and then at the same, in the same breath, try to say, but that man is a woman and that woman is a man. It's it's absolutely absurd, um, and in self contradictory, but we've become so entrenched in this notion of my individual freedom being able to dictate truths and not only for myself, but to force you to, uh, to affirm my counterfactual thoughts and feelings has, is really a disturbing trend. And I I do think a lot of it goes back to a loss of, of metaphysical realism. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that in that context, this uh, concept of conscience as a final ruler 
of your of your ethical decisions uh, without a reservation that this conscience should be informed by truth by by proper reading of the reality it can it can lead to huge distortion i just read an interview for with one of polish dominican who who is who actually practices blessing to same sex couples even before this recent document of the vatican and he says well the, the church is behind the science uh, which we, we need to adopt and uh, actually uh, catholics are sometimes uh, an, unmature because they 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 don't uh, they don't uh, make decisions based on soul on the conscience and this brings to to my mind the uh, john henry newman who who was very uh, was he, uh, important proponent of the of the of the conscience but his understanding of the conscience was as far as i understand him was that conscience needs to be informed by the faith by the by the truth it's not completely independent. How, how do you see the problem with the misuse of the concept of the co conscience to justify certain behaviors uh, without at all reference to education of the conscience? Yes, and this is something that, you know, Ratzinger speaks at length about as well, the relationship between truth, conscience, and freedom. And in some sense, it's it's like both sides are using the word conscience but with completely different meanings where they're they're not they don't have the same definition and that's problematic because conscience is not my personal sentiments about what i want to be the case or what i would like to be the case um conscience is as ratzinger talks about the the traditional thomist scholastic distinction between synderesis and conscientia, the synderesis being the more metaphysical level of this sort of internal grasp, the, the truths written on our hearts, and then the conscientia being the specific judgment of an individual case. Well, he prefers to replace the term synderesis with anamnesis because it's, it's sort of this, which of course is Platonic and Augustinian, that's why, and relates to saint paul but it's this remembering of this truth that i do not create it's conscience is not the ability of me to dictate what is morally right and wrong it's conscience is an awareness that helps me recognize that i am not the source of moral truth but am beholden to it and so conscience is there to help us recognize the limits of our freedom and to point us in the right direction not it's not meant to be a, the the appeal to um complete autonomy from all external input at all and the reality of is as you pointed out there's the obligation to forms one to form one's conscience which means to learn and study the truth of the the matter and to conform your thought to that truth. You can't really be a Catholic in good standing who has been told the moral law and then say, well, I don't accept that. I choose to look at it a different way because then you're rejecting revelation and you, you must always trust God over yourself. So this appeal to conscience where so well, well, I don't feel it's that bad. I think it's okay contrary to the to divine revelation in the perennial teaching of the church is to reject god it it is not it does not free you it is not it does not it does not acquit you of the charges it in some ways can make you guilty more guilty because you're you're rejecting the truth being presented to you and um ratzinger also talks about how Yes, there's an obligation to to follow one's conscience, as Aquinas says, even an erroneous conscience. But your if your conscience is erroneous because of your prior decisions that warped your ability to perceive the truth, you are not guiltless in that. That you have, through your choices to commit and not repent of sin, 
have weakened and dulled your conscience so that conscience cannot be equated merely with a lack of feelings of guilt. Because someone who is guilty but doesn't feel it is more of a monster than a saint. So if you have malformed your conscience so much that your sins no longer bother you, that's not a state of freedom, and that's not a state of being innocent. It's the result of you not forming your conscience and not conforming to the truth of, of the gospel. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it somewhat relates to the, this rejection of the concept of intrinsic evil. Don't you think so? That undermining the, the true meaning of the, of the conscience it's often correlated with the rejections of the concept of intrinsic evil, which is uh, so well explained in Veritati Splendor. Do you see connection um, here? Absolutely. F first of all, Veritati Splendor is a brilliant document. I really love that encyclical. And it spells this out so clearly that there are certain things that are intrinsically evil and therefore never justifiable. It doesn't matter the circumstances. And this is the teaching of the church, right? I mean, you can go to the catechism. The primary source of the moral goodness or evil of an act is its nature or the object of the act. Secondarily, the intention or motive, if you will, the circumstances are the least important. It's not that they don't, they and they can only contribute to the degree of good or evil, but not whether it's good or evil. Mm -hmm. So the goodness or evilness of the act is there's an objective character to that. And circumstances do not change that objective fact. They only make it qualitatively better or less good, but not they don't change that fundamental character. So it seems that, that um, we have found ourselves in a world where people's internal feelings um, dictate their actions and um, in abstraction with uh, with reality, that we are forced um, by the society and sometimes by the governments to comply with those feelings. How should we, as Catholics, react to this sort of situations? And uh, I'm I'm thinking in terms of um, of of the political situation right now, but also uh, in our universities, in our workplaces. How do we react to this? By being strong, vocal advocates of the truth, moral truth, natural law, and even divine law. You know, our faith is not meant to be merely private. It is intended to be public. And um, even as the Second Vatican Council teaches, one of the roles of the laity is to help God's plan be lived out in every area of life and society, including the political order. I mean, it explicitly states that the, um, the laity are meant to help purify the temporal order, including in the laws of the political community. You know, Christ is king. And as Catholics, we are to be advocates of Christian values to our society and to conform our nations to moral truth, especially when it comes to matters of justice. Um, and we cannot remain silent and just go with the flow as we see our, our societies eroded. We, we have to really be advocates of the truth of the gospel and of the, the natural law um, to try to prevent our societies from um, degrading within. Okay. And um, how far do we um, go in promoting the idea of the kingship of Christ in our society? Um, when we speak to certain people right now, they do not understand what we are talking about. Uh, uh, they right. think that we want to dictate to them how they should live, um, you know, that we want to take away their freedom from them. 
how far do we go with promotion of king, Christ's kingship? I mean, it's a very, it can be difficult when you're trying to get into individual policy decisions. But I will say this, that even within a Catholic society or even within a Catholic country, there's still the existence of a limited religious liberty, meaning it is you, you can't con forcibly convert people by the sword or at the point of a gun. And even within a Catholic country, there's allowance for religious liberty, meaning, meaning a, a lack of coercion in religious matters. Um, but that doesn't mean that the society can't promote the, the fundamental truths of, of morality, especially. Um, it's true that the state does not have direct rights over the spiritual realm. Right. That even goes back to Pope Leo the Thirteenth. That's not just since Vatican II. The um, but it is the 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 government's role one to promote justice, right? Well, that's something knowable through human reason as well. Um, but to promote sound morality and to um, not promote vice. So the, the purpose of society is to provide a, a proper environment within which humans can flourish. Well, they can't flourish contrary to virtue. And so it is part of the, the role of society to promote sound mor morals. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned Catholic countries. I'm trying hard to think um, what they might be, um, and I cannot think of one. Um, Nowadays, there aren't really. I'm, yeah, there used to be a lot more of them. So, I, I mean, I mean, the last ones were Ireland that uh, declared a public apostasy um, by by their political act of uh, of uh, of allowing abortion. Um, you know, we just had uh, elections here in Poland, and uh, as a result of these elections, we have a new ruling uh, coalition that is promising us the introduction of hate speech laws. Um, and so, uh, you know, we are far away from the from those days when um, when we were uh, as Catholics in a position of saying, you know, it is not our um, obligation and our prerogative to rule over the spiritual realm and everybody has a, a, a certain sphere of freedom. Everybody mm -hmm. is free to choose or reject God. Right now we are in a situation that we have to be worried uh, how far we will have to go in terms of um, personal sacrifice and for instance uh, even white martyrdom if you will or maybe even a red one. Um, in case of, of governments pushing forward the age agendas that they are uh, uh, promoting. So big introduction, but I guess, but I guess uh, is there a way for us to take any practical steps right now uh, when we are all, as Catholics, on the defensive? Well, for one thing, I think we need to help inform our fellow Catholics of their obligations to the faith in society. Who do you serve first, Caesar or God? You know, and um, it's not an option; it's an obligation to imbue our culture with the light of the gospel. Now, where someone like Ratzinger in his political views would come in. Um, he, he, he likes to take the approach of looking at the Old Testament, for instance. You know, there's times when you're, when you're in power and you have a good king. There's times when you're in power and you have a bad king who doesn't follow the faith. And then there's times when you're in complete exile and you're not in charge at all. What do you do? You know, if we read in um, Jeremiah, well, work for the good of your society that you're in. So in some sense, it doesn't matter what your current government is. Your role 
is to try to improve the society, act justly in your business dealings, try to convert people to the gospel, try to help guide their morality and over time win them over. It's not just, it's not like, well, 90% of our country is atheist or pagan, so let's get a Catholic emperor to completely control them. It, no, that's not really going to help either, per se. Like, it, you you want to, you have to try to evangelize the culture so the culture changes. And as a Christified culture, you then make better decisions for your government. Um, but I think too many Catholics have this misunderstanding of this, this notion of the separation between church and state that's that's inappropriate. It's not that there isn't a distinction. I'm not saying that. It is true that the, the, the secular government does not have control over the spiritual realm. But Catholic rulers are to be guided in their duties by the truth. And in regards to morality, in regards to the natural law. Um, and I think it's important because sometimes you have to turn the the opponent's arguments against them. Well, if we're talking about liberty here, why are you saying it's wrong for me to speak Catholic truth to you in public? And then I'm going to be charged with hate speech. Because now you're saying my religion isn't included in one of the protected classes. Well, it's, it's hypocrisy. Um, why is it, you know, the reality of it is most laws are an imposition of morality. So this notion that I don't want to impose my morality on you is absurd. Almost every law is a moral, is making a moral claim and a moral judgment. Also, you can point out to people that two people can support the same law for different reasons. So by supporting a specific law, I'm not mandating that you agree with my reasons for that law. I'm not imposing a philosophy on you. But if you are allowed to enact laws according to your philosophy, which we all have, right? I mean, politics is largely about the virtue of justice. Well, justice is morality. So every politician is using their morality in the policies that they advocate for. So if you're allowed to do that, why am I not allowed to do that? Why am I not allowed to try to get our laws to correspond to my understanding of, of the moral good and justice? So I think some Catholics have been tricked into thinking that we have to check our religion at the door and our philosophy at the door, but everyone else is allowed to impose theirs on us. And that's simply false. And I think it started with JFK, um, who said that... Uh, you know, he's Catholic only to the threshold of his uh, of the Oval Office. <laughs> yes, which um, is a very a very un-Catholic way of looking at your role. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. And but it was, I, I'm not sure. I don't know if there was a huge resistance to that position, or if everybody was ecstatic that now we have in the Catholic Church that now we have a Catholic president of the United States. So it's fine that he says things like that. I don't no, know. So I wasn't around, but <laughs> I, I know one explanation on that because he was called by the Protestant pastors. I think it was in Texas, and they and it was almost like hearing. And he was uh, was check whether he will be taking uh, orders from Vatican because the Protestant majority was quite concerned that Catholic president might might impose uh, Vatican views on America. But I think it was. And in, including big names in in that in that group of Protestant pastors like Billy Graham and others, I'm 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 afraid that they misunderstood the role of Catholic Church and, and the teaching. I don't know whether you would like to comment on that, but it was a kind of because now the President Biden approach, which is extremely radical and is a, a big shame for all Catholics globally, what he is doing because he is forcing things which are really atrocious on the global scene, not only in US. But th this started much earlier. I don't know what probably you, you might comment on that. Yeah, I mean, the, 
it is at least Ratzinger's view. He would not, for instance, advocate for like the bishops being in charge of the government. He doesn't advocate for that. Um, and within the realm of practical prudential laws on very, you know, specific questions, there's a lot of leeway um, for making those prudential decisions, especially ones that are based on knowledge of like, that is not part of revelation, right? Like scientific questions about the environment or, you know, economic, the way economic things work outside of the issues of justice, you know? Um, so the, the role of the Catholic politician would be to try to help conform the laws of the society to the, the philosophical and theological truth about morality and justice with respect to the secular realm, to, to help the temporal order run justly. And no one should be afraid of that. You know, there's no reason. It's, it's not like the Catholic politicians are they going to mandate everyone go to Sunday mass at their local Catholic parish. That's not going to happen. That wouldn't be something you could you could do, um, but they would be expected to uphold the truth, the moral truth, and uh, especially when with regards to issues of justice, um, and to execute those things appropriately. And I would my res response would be. Any politician who gets elected is going to do that. They are going to be drawing from their own philosophy and their own sense of morality and ethics. So why should a Catholic be excluded from that possibility if no one else is to be excluded from that possibility? Right. But I think in terms of politicians, a lot of them are excluding themselves uh, from that situation and they're willing to compromise even before mm -hmm. they're asked to do that. Um, you know, aren't we getting uh, too little advice from the church in terms of how should we um, uh, comport ourselves in the, in the public life? Uh, so in, in other words, recently Cardinal Cordi, uh, Cordilone from San Francisco mm -hmm. has publicly stated that Nancy Pelosi cannot receive communion, isn't that 30 years too late? Um, shouldn't that happen 30 years ago when she still cared a little bit about her Catholicism? And the same for President Biden, you know? Um, and, and shouldn't we be taught as Catholics that a Catholic must not vote for someone who's supporting uh, killing of innocents, so abortion, for instance, or, or so-called euthanasia? Uh, do you think that we are getting sufficient assistance from the church in that realm? If you're asking for my opinion, my opinion would be no, we're not getting enough. And so right now, right now, if you look at the political scene in the United States, we have this huge election coming and people are talking about reasons why they should vote for Republican candidate or Democratic candidate. And it seems that they're talking at cross purposes, but shouldn't the church speak loudly and clearly that there are certain issues that are more important than others, like life? Yes, and, and I think it has. And now we've, in some sense, we're, we're lucky because Roe versus Wade was, was overturned which is not something I, I wasn't sure if it was going to happen in my lifetime. And so we've been lucky that we, the pro-life movement has had a major victory, largely due to Catholic justices in the Supreme Court. Um, but who, objectively speaking, also interpreted the Constitution more objectively properly than Roe versus Wade did originally. So it's not just that Catholics took over and changed things. They I think even legal scholars will tell you their their view on the Constitution is much more accurate. Um, so we've had a lot of gains, and and I do think the Church has provided guidelines. Um, I know under um, 
when he was still Cardinal Ratzinger, there were directives given that were very explicit about there, there is a hierarchy of goods and not every issue carries the same weight. And that as a Catholic, you do have to give the proper weight to different issues. You know, the issue of abortion is not is much more important than the issue of minimum wage. It doesn't mean that economic questions aren't important or that they can't be factored into the equation, but part of our calculus does have to be first and foremost guarding the most fundamental and most important issues um, over the less important more prudential questions. Right. Um, so the way that we are looking at this uh, situation, the way that we are seeing right now is that um, in a lot of cases, our freedom of religion and our freedom of conscience is going to be threatened. Um, and um, that is going to be happening in uh, America. That is going to be happening in Poland. And it is happening in Western Europe right now. I'm not sure if you are aware, but the French parliament is right now debating the inclusion of rights to abortion in their constitution. Yeah. So where do you see the biggest threats coming to our uh, freedom of conscience? Is it from the secular world? Is it from this... Um, uh, religion of subjective perception of, uh, of of our own persons and bodies, uh, the transgender movement, or is it from other religions? Is it is it from Islam? Is it from uh, the increasing migration of Hindus, religious Hindus, into America? Uh, they are very um, open and um, and uh, and tolerant right now, but in India they're not, and they are persecuting Christians. Catholics specifically, and killing them. So where is that biggest threat to our freedom of conscience and our religious freedom coming from? Well, with regards to freedom in the political realm, I don't know enough about Hinduism, for instance. Like, I don't know where they stand on moral issues. They could, in some cases, be allies in, if they have similar moral values. They don't. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what their stances are on those questions. Um, I think the bigger threat is from the secular society and atheism or, you know, agnosticism. Um, the general, what concerns me about the United States, for instance, is the general apathy towards things religious, if not outright um, discussed at religious things. Um, so to me, that is the, the bigger threat. Um, I have a hard time understanding our culture in many ways nowadays, because it seems to be so self-contradictory because it, it, it both pushes individual autonomy to such an extreme while at the same time implementing totalitarian tactics to to supposedly advocate for it and which reminds me of the forked tongue right it's like the society is in some sense falling for the lie of the the evil one because it it speaks out of both sides of its mouth regularly and people don't perceive the actual self-contradictory character of what it's doing and saying that, you know, because I have a right to decide what I am for myself, I can force you at the point of government guns to affirm my <laughs> self description to where you can't say anything negative about the way I think. But by doing that, they're not allowing you to express your thoughts and authentically and openly. So it's this weird, again, it's like this, it's totalitarian control mixed with a facade of individual liberty. 
And it's it's absolutely mind boggling to me how people don't see this complete contradictory nature of this of this movement. Yeah, and uh, I I think I think a lot of the problems that we're seeing right now is with what happened uh, in schools some time ago when we um, were taught to regurgitate some of the knowledge and encyclopedic knowledge that we were given, repeat somebody else's opinions and, and not being taught to think independently. Uh, and then we cannot put a connection between what happens to someone whose freedom is being trampled and then what the consequence of that will be to us. Um, when did that when did that break happen in the United States? Because I've studied in the United States in the early 1990s, mm -hmm. and I did not see that. When did that big shift happen? I'm not sure. I I don't know enough about the history of the educational system, and partly it's difficult here because this the we do have a National Department of Education but our education systems can vary greatly from state to state and from county to county, um, sometimes from school district to school district. So it, it can vary widely from one school to the other, but as a general point, I would say I am still utterly confused as to why we don't teach basic logic in high schools. There's a lot of college students that will never have taken a logic course, just going over the basic logical fallacies and valid and sound arguments and what constitutes those things. And then we wonder why our public discourse is a bunch of rhetoric with no substance, because most people in our culture have not taken a logic course and they don't know a logical fallacy when they hear one or when they make one. And I mean, we think we're so advanced in this day and age, but you look at the education system during the scholastic period in the 13th century, you know, a basic level of education in the university system, logic was one of the four principles or seven, depending on how you want to do the math. Um, that it was one of the, the foundational courses you had to take was logic. And we live in an illogical society because we're not taught logic anymore. I think every high school should be required to teach logic. And um, it, it, it's really shocking to me that we haven't figured that out as a society yet. Yeah, and then the situation that you described about uh, people... Um, acting as if they are according to the fourth tongue. Um, that is something that I, I'm not sure if, if you ever had this experience in the United States before. You're clearly having it right now. But, uh, you know, in, in Poland, uh, in the 80s, um, it happened that I sort of started reading 1984 by uh, Orwell. Mm -hmm. And it was a, this book was forbidden in Poland because it was a very exact description of what uh, was happening in our country. And the, the principle of double speak uh, or, or double think is not about persons, it's about thoughts and it's about revolution. So, uh, you know, right now a person is um, allowed to think and feel whatever they want, but tomorrow, they will be uh, the old wave of the revolution and they will be persecuted again uh, and some new sort of form will come. And it seems like it's a like it's a religious movement. Do you uh, have a sense that this whole rejection of reality, the rejection of logic, the rejection of reason and embracing of emotions is actually a return to paganism to periods before Christianity in the Roman Empire? Yes. And I related to that, I think the because it, it's not based on reason, it's not based on metaphysics, it's not based on logic, it's largely rhetorical and emotional. 
and therefore it often puts up a facade that's really not true. So for instance, liberal progressives talk about the importance of tolerance, but they're not really more tolerant. They're just tolerant of different ideas and different um, so quote unquote groups. And equally, if not more intolerant than conservatives are about people with conservative and traditional ideas, right? So if, if they were truly tolerant, they would be welcoming the tr traditional Catholic and, you know, Aristotelian voices in the discussions, and they're not. And they are very oppressive when they're in power with regards to those things. So they're not about freedom and they're not about tolerance. They're about shifting what is tolerated and what isn't. And that's not the same thing. And so often people get duped because, well, it sounds right. Like we should be tolerant, like be kind to people. And they don't. But it's always, really... it's always toleration of vices, isn't that's, it? Exactly. It's always toleration of weakness and, and not of strength, it, of, of laziness and sloth and not of effort. Correct. And that's where it's, that's why I'm saying it's a facade. It's, it's a, it's a, it's rhetoric, emotional, and it's not even true. It's a, it's just a, a mask they put on. It's a catchphrase they use to get you on their side. But if you look deeply into what it's actually advocating, it's none of the things it claims to be. It's not about liberty. It's not about tolerance. It's about to like, rejecting traditional values and morality and substituting it for, as you said, vicious behavior, vice. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it is, it's, um, it's an illusion. And uh, we, we as Catholics, as uh, members of, um, of, of a group that created this great uh, Christian civilization, are partly responsible for what happened. Do you think that the reason that we allowed this to happen is because we lost clarity of what it is that constitutes our civilization and that we permitted other cultures, other civilizations to infil infiltrate our, ours? That probably would vary from country to country. Um, I do think in the, in the United States, which is, you know, I've been to other countries, but I, I didn't grow up in any other countries. I do think we've lost some of our own identity. Um, I also think there are probably some problematic aspects to our society from its foundation that are part of, that could be part of the problem but that's not really my area of expertise. But in general, the Western societies through the enlightenment, I think have, and modern philosophy have just been, we've had bad philosophy basically. And, it, and whether or not you've ever studied the modern philosophers directly, we've been influenced by them and through a trickle-down effect from the professors in the universities down to the general culture and the way we look and, and see things. And so that's why it's, you know, I've been to Europe several times. And one thing that often makes me sad is you'll see this, it, well, and Ratzinger spoke about this back in 1958, even before the council, right? The, the new heathenism in the church, the new paganism in the church, where it's like you have a facade of Catholicism when in reality, the Catholics are pagans and they don't even right. know that they're pagans. They think they're good Catholics. In reality, they're pagan. And Right, right. But, you know, the, the difference between then and now is that then we had them in church listening and we could have told them something. Now right. they're not in church. They're not listening. They're hostile. They don't want to learn. Yes, and sadly, the especially starting in the mid to late, well, the late 60s especially, and then moving forward from there into the 70s, I mean, the 
the the bad aspects of the culture did infiltrate our experience in in the church i mean i don't think there's any way to to deny that it um the these movements began to be adopted at the local parish level quite ubiquitously quite in, in many locations and it did water down our catholic culture and our catholic identity yeah we'll be finishing our interview uh, if we if we could ask you to share a, a some sort of uh, wisdom and hope uh, to finalize our meeting and to show perhaps what is the source of your hope apart from this transcendental hope in, in our salvation and but even in the more temporary uh, terms what, what, what would you see as a source of hope for for, for this challenging situation for for us uh, as catholics as as people who respect freedom and and democracy i think one thing that i'm starting to see in the united states and in including in the catholic church in the united states is that the the younger generations as much as i worry about them um a lot, there are a significant number of people within the younger generations that are recognizing the absurdity of these ideologies that have taken over and they want nothing to do with it. And I do see a lot of conversions happening through Catholic media and social media outlets. Now, there's a lot of bad media and bad Catholic social media as well. But I, I, you do see a lot of conversions happening and people coming to their senses and recognizing the absurdity. It's like the, the, um, the leftist agenda has pushed itself so far that their own people are starting to recognize how absurd it is. And that's leading to people to think, wait, what? No, that's not, that's not what I signed up for. They're starting to actually think about these things more and when they're confronted with the traditional values and with um, Catholicism, even they're starting to see the truth and embrace it wholeheartedly. Mm. Amen. Uh, Richard, thank you very much for this very exciting exchange of ideas and your insights into Catholic faith and culture and your sharing with us your experience that was very 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 beneficial and very thought-provoking thanks a lot and and we wish you very good time and further work for word on fire thank you thank you, thank you for having me on i really appreciate it thank you